Hello and welcome to today's Black History Month Showcase. My name is Hugo Monnier and I'm going to be your host today. I'm a former rugby player who played at Harlequins for England and fortunate enough to play for the British and Irish Lions. Uh, I'm now a broadcaster and someone that's deeply passionate about the conversation of diversity and inclusion. Um, there's been studies that reveal in 60% of black professionals still experience racism in the workplace and 25% of people still find that assumptions are made of their abilities, character or behaviour due to their race. And such statistics emphasise the importance of Black History Month now more than ever before. So on to our first speaker. So Naomi Sase is our first speaker today. She began her 20-year TV and media career working on MTV News as a producer, director, and as a presenter. Naomi's become a powerful advocate with her most recent roles, including the on-screen diversity executive and interim head of diversity and inclusion at Channel 4 and head of innovation and diversity for Media Trust. So welcome, Naomi. Thank you so very much, Hugo, and thank you for Speakers um, Corner for inviting me to speak at this showcase. So today I want to talk about something that is not usually spoken about in the world of diversity, inclusion, equity and belonging, but it may be the most single important aspect to making real meaningful change in our workspace and cultural environment. Now, we all understand that the world is rapidly changing, right? Finance is changing, social norms are changing, ideas are getting bigger and more complex, movements are being created, and technology is emerging faster than society's capability to keep up. It's no wonder that we are experiencing a mental health surge, and it's obvious something has to give before we actually unravel. And yet, we're still here. We're still trying to figure out how to create inclusive cultures, still trying to figure out how we can put together environments and spaces where we all can say we belong. And despite all our first world advances, we find ourselves struggling to tackle and overcome 600 years of untruths, a gaslighting event that warped our perception of ourselves and changed the trajectory of who we could have actually become. Now in the 21st century, as we sense our unraveling, we frantically look for our answers by recruiting more diversity in hopes that it would lead to inclusion without realizing that we're still using the same mindset and the same vernacular in the same vein in which the original problem was created in the first place. So my question is this, why? Why are we still here at this junction? Why are we still battling with racism, bias, prejudice and discrimination? Why has it taken so long as intelligent human beings to even venture into a dialogue, recognizing that an era so long ago has stunted human growth for centuries and has issued a disservice to the advancement of humankind? There is a glitch. There is a glitch in our psyche that prevents us from fast forwarding into new ways of thinking and new innovations, which incidentally could have solved our wicked problems such as poverty, climate change and inequities. That glitch is caused by pieces of information missing on how we communicate and consume information. You see, we are far more powerful than what we have been programmed to believe, cognitively speaking that is. But the tools to tap into that cognitive resource are rarely taught in our school curriculums, nor in our universities, and definitely not in the workplace. So we grow up a little bit lopsided, with lopsided ideas. Back in 2004, I left Big Brother triumphant. <laughs> no, I, I didn't win the 70K, and I wasn't a contestant. In fact, I was the first producer-director in the UK who produced the very first show. But in 2004, I left television altogether because I had a sense that I would never achieve my potential in the TV world. I somehow felt that I didn't quite belong. Of course, it wasn't explicitly expressed, but there was always this feeling that I had to work twice as hard to get half as much. And I couldn't put my finger on what exactly made me feel that way. Many people from many walks of life have actually felt this phenomenon. I'm sure you have too. And I have now come to the understanding that affinity bias was at play, but how was it perceived if you didn't know what it actually was? 
So I went into property and by 2008, I was one of the very few successful black female property investors and trainers. And my aim was to achieve financial independence because I felt my time was my greatest asset. My thinking was, if I had my time back, I could do amazing things under my own volition. And that intersectional representation of being an African female in a very white male dominated world should have given me the heebie-jeebies. I should have had a hard time rising to the top. I should have experienced the box because in reality, the odds were against me. If I had believed what society programs us to believe that I am um, a certain thing, I would have most certainly have failed. You see, social cognitive programming forces us to look through a specific lens. It tells us where we should place ourselves in society. The programming is riddled in our media, in our books, in our fairy tales, in Disney films, in advertising, in newspapers, and even in our language. It told me that there was no Prince Charming for black girls, that black girls grew up to be aggressive women, and that we would always be over-sexualized and eroticized. Black girls weren't wealthy property investors. Black girls weren't senior scientists in Harvard or city developers. But it's not only black girls who have a box, it's women in general, black and brown men, it's the LGBTQ plus community, those deemed as disabled and all the glorious intersectionality within. So society tells you where to place yourself. Each of us has something cemented in our brain that we learned at a very young age. Have a think for a moment. What is something that has always been in your head even if you have no use for it whatsoever right now. I bet many of you remember saying supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, if you were in my generation. I also remember being a brownie guy. I promised that I will do my best and do my duty to God to serve the queen. And I even put my hand up as a behavior cue because that's what I learned. So it's worth thinking about how some of the information we acquire as children impacts us through our lives and the implications this has upon entering the workforce. You see, social cognitive programming is so powerful that young children at the age of four and even five have already picked up social cues and act accordingly. To illustrate this, you can go and watch the doll test on YouTube this evening just to actually um, understand what cognitive programming does to young children. So consider the multitude of subtle biased views that rain upon us every single day and we're not even aware of it. And here's the rub. How do you become aware of something you're not aware of? You see, what many of us don't know is that we have more than 400 billion bits of information riding on our personal biofield. It's ours. You're sitting on it right now. You walk around with it every single day. In fact, it affects the way you feel, the way you think, and ultimately the way you behave. But we're only aware of 2,000 bits of, that, of information. That's a sliver of reality. Your information is riddled with cognitive programming from your family, your peer group, your environment, and society as a whole. And the moment you get into the workplace, you're pretty much set to interact with people who are like you and people who are not like you. And you will know how you have been programmed by how you emotionally respond to situations that you're not familiar with. Your programming is your default. And so, because it's your default, you're so used to your own modality of behavior and you become comfortable. And because we like comfort, we stay there. And that's how the status quo stays intact and never moves or very, incrementally small. You see, race, cultural, and emotional fluency are tricky subjects to navigate because it brings up uncomfortable emotions within our cognitive programming, and we don't like feeling uncomfortable. But we need to understand that we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable if we're going to move the dial. We shy away from challenging someone's poor behavior in fear of offending the offender. We protect our dignity when we unintentionally issue microaggressions, professing it wasn't our intention to offend, whilst ignoring the negative impact we have made on the recipient. 
We allow poor behavior to pass because we don't have the adequate words or eloquent words to challenge it. And we call ourselves not racist, but have no clue that being anti-racist trumps being not racist any day because it neurologically changes behavior and thus our programming. You see, no one has ever reached the top of their field by being comfortable. Change comes when you feel uncomfortable. No one ever innovates without acquiring different information and that can feel uncomfortable. No one ever becomes their true selves without expanding their hearts and minds to absorb different perspectives and dynamic emotional spectrums. You see, in order for us to evolve in any situation, we, each and every one of us, need to think deeply and take control of the billions of bits of information we walk around with every day. That's when moments of clarity occur. That's when we shift our neurology and change our habits. You see, those 400 billion bits of information that exudes from your body is palpable and visceral. It can be felt and perceived by others. You can walk into an organization and instantly feel the culture. That feeling bubbles up into consciousness, forcing you to create a meaning. And that's when you can put your finger on that which you couldn't articulate. That is how we, change, we create change. By being hyper aware of the information you possess, your behavior cues, your language, your automatic thought patterns and your emotions, you start to change the way you behave. By seeking new ways to express what you really mean, that may mean, change, mean changing your language and the lens through which you look through. By getting clear on who you really want to be and how you want to represent. And by seeking new experiences that pushes your boundaries. And by understanding that nothing in life has any meaning but the meaning you give it. Thank you very much. Naomi, thank you so, so much for that. Well, on to our next speaker. Uh, Naomi mentioned about feeling uncomfortable. Well, this person, this absolute phenomenon, spent a lot of her time feeling uncomfortable through training and through doing what she does. And over the course of the London 2012 Games, Nicola Adams MBE became an icon after winning Great Britain's first ever female boxing gold. Get ready to get inspired by double Olympic gold medalist, WBO world champion and Great Britain's most successful female boxer of all time, Nicola Adams, who joins us today. Nicola, great to have you um, today and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm sure you're inspired from hearing from Naomi. We'll certainly be delving into that a little bit later on. But I wanted to first ask you um, quite simply, we're obviously talking about Black History Month and uh, diversity inclusion, but a simple question to start with is, why is it important that we celebrate and talk about Black history, uh, especially dedicate a month to it? So you don't learn about it in schools. I never learned, learned about it in school. I always had to um, research anything that I wanted to, wanted to know. So I think it's really important to have Black History Month just so that um, not just our culture, but other cultures as well can learn about the history of, of Black people. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Nicola, because I find myself, both my parents born in Nigeria, I was born here in, in England, Islington, and... I've embarrassed myself a few times just not fully understanding it and some of that's just my own personal responsibility but when it's not part of the educational syllabus when it's not widely taught you do find yourselves actually wanting to understand more and most recently um, the foreign secretary Dominic Raab when we were talking about taking the knee and that kind of thing I, I heard him on a radio interview and this is the foreign secretary who went on and said, I'm not quite sure where the taking the knee came from. Perhaps it came from the Game of Thrones. And I thought, if, if our foreign secretary in our country doesn't even understand our history, I think there's probably a lot of people that don't understand our history, to, to quote Naomi, a lot of untruths. And that's why it's perhaps important to discuss this if we want to live in this multicultural society. I guess to counter that, because not everyone perhaps wants to celebrate it or wants to have that conversation. So what do you say to people that say, why should we have a month dedicated to black history? Because we don't have a white history month. I mean, for the, same, the plain simple fact that um, you talk about white history all the way through school. Um, so you pretty much know everything that's going on. But with black history, 
you're not taught anything at all apart from um, a little bit on slavery and that's it and that's where it ends you don't learn about um, black scientists people that invent um, black people that invented invented things you don't hear about any of that stuff so I'd say it's it's not so much maybe that you don't have to celebrate it, but I feel like it's definitely an area where um, you you should still educate yourself on it. Absolutely, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I, I think to a certain extent the, the the almost the admission that we need a month to celebrate and dedicate Black History isn't really ideal for me. Um, but if our Black culture and history um, and like you said, celebrating people who have actually given so much to this country, if that was incorporated as part of your educational pathway, then perhaps there yeah. wouldn't be a need for it. Um, but until it is, then you also you, you, you need to have this standalone event to be able to talk about it. Um, but for you growing up, you know, we've, we've had the phrase many a time, especially over the last 18 months, you've got to see it to believe it. What inspired you? Who did you look to as inspiration when, when you were growing up on your path to success? Well, my hero was Muhammad Ali. I mean, he's, you know, he was the greatest boxer of all time. Um, he, um, he did a lot of things for, for human rights. I just loved everything about him um, from winning his Olympic medal, going pro, um, for everything that he stood for outside of the ring as well. So that's why he was a, a big inspiration for me. And, and for you, going from someone who's inspired by Muhammad Ali, picking up your boxing gloves, getting absolutely incredible at what you did, landing in 2012, having that iconic moment, and you've had many moments. How do you then adjust when you've looked for inspiration, but now so many people are looking to you for that same inspiration? I'm just always thinking about moving forward, creating new goals, looking for more areas of, of change, not just in the Black community, but in the LGBTQ community for um, for females as well, um, there's still a huge struggle um, for, for female equality. There's just, there's a lot of work to be done. And it's like, for me, I feel like it should have, or it should have already been done already. These, these things shouldn't even be an issue anymore. Like, I just don't want the next generation having to still celebrate Black History Month, having to still fight for equality. Like these are things that should have been taken care of years ago, generations ago. And it's just, it's so sad to see that we're still, we're still trying to change that now. Of course. And, you know, you, you've been outspoken and it's absolutely fantastic to hear your thoughts, you know, uh, a fighter in the ring and outside of it. But You've already mentioned the inequality that females have, um, that black people have, as well as the LGBTQ um, community have. Um, you represent all those things. Do you find it um, a real pressure or is it a privilege for you to really step out and try and change the narrative and try and change that base of inequality that you may have had to endure? For me, it's, it's been a, a chance to really step out and, and say, hey, you know, even though I am all those things, I've been I've been able to achieve um, some really you know some really great inspiring things as well. And I guess it's just for me, it's just all about the next generation to be able to see me and say, hey, do you know what? She's absolutely done the most, and she's had all those other things that all those other things against her, and I've just never let let that hold me back. Um, I guess I've, I've always been the type of person that always wants to wants to learn and improve and progress. I believe that you're never the finished article. There's always something something new you can learn. There's always an area of skill that you can develop. And it for me, it's the same thing with educating myself on other cultures as well. Um, and finding out about other other religions, other people, and and just being able to know a lot more. Um, I just think it's just really really important that not just me, but I believe everybody should should do that. And I think it's the only way that we're, we're ever gonna be able to get along is if we actually educate ourselves on, on, on all the cultures. I think that's a, a really good point, which we've briefly touched upon, but Black History Month is almost labeled um, 
this is us, this is our culture, this is mm. our history, go out and learn it. And it's almost, it feels like it appeals to everyone apart from black people. But you're also saying that during that month of black history, where it's a, a moment for you to reflect as well as learn more about yourself, your ancestors, and each and every other person that might look similar to you, had a similar background, would that be right? I mean, it's the, the one time in the month that I'm always seeing something new that I didn't know before. Um, which always surprises me. I think I'm, I think I've I've learned learned a lot, and then there's something else. I'll be like, oh wow, you know, there's there's something else that I didn't know that I've I've learned today. And I think that's the the good thing about Black History Month. You, it's a time where you get to to learn things that you might not necessarily have, have known before, especially because it's not taught as a curriculum at, at school. Um, I just I I think moving forward, really, this is something that should be taught in school. Um, so that the next generation have a better understanding of, of black culture. And it's not just for the one month of the year. I remember speaking to Jason Robinson, who famously scored the only try for England in 2003 when they went on to win the World Cup. He was made England captain for the first time. I've forgotten the exact date of it, but during last Black History Month, he then realised he was actually the first uh, black England captain in a professional era. And that was something he was finding out almost 20 years on. Um, and that was a real moment of reflection for him. He, he wished he'd known at the time, not just what it represented, playing for your country is incredible, capturing countries, um, incredible, but that deeper understanding of the achievement he made. And it was a shame that he wasn't able to fully immerse himself in that moment, during the moment, but took almost two decades to find out. So. It is a real um, month of discovery, which which you've already just pointed out. And and lastly, be before we get into the panel discussion, there's still so much to talk about. Um, the last eighteen months is, you know, this conversation of diversity, inclusion, um, equality, um, discrimination has been at the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, but how do you start a conversation with someone who's looking to perhaps understand a little bit more about your experiences and and wanting to do something about it? The big key really is the listening, um, making sure you're taking on board what people are saying to you and, and not just thinking about it from your point of view. You need to, you need to think about it from the other perspective and, and how, how racism has been affecting black people. So when you haven't ex ex experienced racism before maybe, um, it'll be a lot harder to understand from your point of view. So I think the big, the big key really is just being able to listen and ask the person um, what they want and what they need and how um, you can help them. It's such a good point, purely because you're trying to make something relatable, which is perhaps unrelatable to almost 95% of the population and wanting them to invest some time into understanding as to how and why you feel or think the way that you do, which is really, really key. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Nicola Adams there, if anyone's got any questions, please do leave them in the Q&A function. But before we get into that panel discussion, we're going to be hearing from our final speaker today, who's a British Nigerian, Nigerian historian, broadcaster, author and filmmaker, David Onoshogo, created TV series including Black and British, A Forgotten History, which was on BBC Two, The World War in BBC Two, and a BAFTA winning Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners, which was also on the BBC. Um, has made him a trailblazer who is changing the world today. I cannot wait to hear his powerful insights and hear his incredible, inspiring story. David, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I'm going to be uh, brief. I've only got 10 minutes. so I'm going to rattle through as much as I can in that time. But I want to talk about the contradiction, the paradox of the heart of Britain in the 21st century, because for decades, we've been slowly becoming a much less racist and less discriminatory society. And attitudinal studies have repeatedly shown this. One of the most recent of those surveys carried out by the Running Mead Trust showed that three quarters of the population, 74%, described themselves as, quote, not at all prejudiced. Only 1% of British people were willing to describe themselves as, quote, very prejudiced against people of other races. The European Social Survey of 2019 asked a sample of the British public if they believed in this quote, some races or ethnic groups are born less intelligent than others. 81% of people disagreed with that statement. That's more than four out of five. 
And this year, the survey for British futures found that 70, 77% of white people, more than three quarters, believe that Englishness is an identity that should be open to people of all races and backgrounds. Now, this is progress. The early migrants to Britain from the Caribbean, the original Windrush generation, often said that around a third of British people were implacably racist. Another third were liable to be racist or prejudiced, and only one third did not hold racial views. Yet, despite the fact that so many people repudiate racism in Britain, Black people remain profoundly disadvantaged and excluded in multiple aspects of life, and the pandemic has made that even more apparent. Black men in the UK are between nine and nine, 10 times uh, more likely to be stopped and searched by the police than white men. Although black people make up around 3.3% of the population of England and Wales, they account for 12% of the prison population. Now that's a higher ratio to population than in the United States with its infamous industrial prison complex. And black women in the United Kingdom in 2021 are five times more likely to die in pregnancy or within the first six weeks after childbirth than white women. What is evident is that we're not the society that three quarters of people claim they want us to be, the one in which people's life chances are not shaped by something as meaningless as skin color. Those statistics don't reflect such a society. So what's happening? How do we explain those realities? How do we account for those statistics? Why the difference between the attitude and aspirations of the majority and the outcomes that we see in our society. The vast majority of people are not able, it seems, by rejecting racism to reshape our society according to their priorities. That majority who do not want to live in a society in which life chances are determined by skin color, I'm afraid we have to recognize an unpleasant fact. What we've done up until now has not worked. It's only got us so far. Despite our repudiation of racial prejudice, our society remains one in which race plays a, a determining role in the life chances and the outcomes of our fellow citizens. Now, part of what's going on is contained within the same statistics I began with. 81% of people in Britain disagree with the statement, some races or ethnic groups are born less intelligent than others. Now, what that means, obviously, is that 19%, almost one in five people, believe that race has a bearing on intellect, despite there being absolutely no evidence to suggest that, and despite literally centuries of attempts by race scientists to prove some sort of correlation between race and intelligence. And there are other statistics that are even more depressing. In 2019, a sample of British people were asked if they agree with this quote, some races or ethnic groups are born and I stress born, harder working than others. 38% of people in the UK said yes. Now that's a biological racial idea about born innate capacities. And what that means is if you're black and British, one in five people that you meet or might interact with on a given day, hold racial biological views from the 19th century that suggest that you're less intelligent. More than one in 10 people believe that you can, you are not and can never be English. And of course, that's not just one in 10 or one in five of the people you might bump into in the street, that's one in five or one in 10 police officers or potential employers who might read your CV or interview you or become your boss and determine how good you are at your job. That's a lot of people, very, very much a minority, but still enough to do great harm to our society. But there's another way of explaining what's going on. And that is that the majority of people who do reject racism and do their best to act in ways that aren't influenced by those ideas from the 19th century and the 18th century, and who are determined to be unracist, that their aspirations only get us so far. Being unracist, evidently, demonstratively, has not been enough. One of the most important ideas that's now being discussed and debated more widely than ever since 2020 and the murder of George Floyd is the idea of structural racism. Now, structural racism, like almost every idea to come out of the study of race, is being deliberately distorted and misrepresented. Structural racism does not, as the tabloids will tell you, mean hyper-racism. It's not a way of saying our society is irredeemably racist. It's not an attack on white people or on the country. What it argues is that race, one of the most powerful ideas ever created, and now hundreds of years old, exists deep 
within the fabric of our society in ways that are often different to recognize. Racism is concealed within cultures and practices and conventions that unintentionally, unwittingly often discriminate against people of color. It exists in our subconscious, and that's true of all of us, whatever our race. The idea of race, the idea of black inferiority and white superiority is structural, historians will tell you, because it was constructed. It was built, it was made, it was invented, it was propagized, it was spread around the world by men who wanted to use it to defend slavery and then empire. It was repurposed multiple times. It was given the, the, uh, the armor of illegitimate fake science. Vast amounts of money, billions of hours of effort and ingenuity were poured into creating the stereotypes that were used to justify slavery and empire. And those stereotypes worked their way into the cultural fabric of our society so deeply that they outlived the slavery and the empires that they were invented to justify and defend. And those stereotypes that were born in the 17th or the 18th or the 19th centuries are with us today. They became part of popular culture. They were transmitted from generation to generation and they remain lingering in the subconsciousness and the collective subconsciousness of all of us. Because to be brought up in a racialized society is to imbibe these ideas, whether we like it or not. Just as to be brought up in a misogynistic society is to subconsciously, no matter what we might wish to be the case, internalize the misogyny all around us. This is not a personal assault on individuals. It is a reality that we are acculturated to our societies and our societies have been affected by these ideas like race and misogyny. Understanding that race is structural is not an attack on a society as it's often mischaracterized. It's an intellectual tool to help us demolish an idea that was built and propagated by men who have been in their graves for centuries. It's too easy in 2021 to believe the culture war narrative that our country is being driven apart, that calls for equality have gone too far, that ideas for better understanding race are really attacks on white people. But if you turn off the constant drumbeat of Westminster and the tabloids and instead listen to what's happening within companies and organizations, what you realize is that this is a moment of enormous social change, perhaps even a shift of consciousness, without doubt, a generational moment. It's being led from the bottom up, often by the private sector, not by politicians who are seeking to use this moment for electoral gain. What the headlines about culture wars conceal is the enormous progress that's being made in companies and institutions and whole sectors of the economy that have begun the process of looking deeply at their cultures and their practices and in some cases, committing themselves to be anti-racist organizations. Countless numbers of people have thought more deeply than ever before about these ideas in the past 24 months. And they've had conversations between groups of friends, between coworkers about race that were previously impossible. There have been initiatives launched in multiple sectors as more and more people in power recognize that the disparities in recruitment, retention, promotion that run across racial lines are barriers to inclusion and progress. And that critically, they will not evaporate of their own volition without investment and commitment to anti-racism. What millions of people have come to understand is that ideas created over centuries and embedded into our societies through popular culture, those ideas will take enormous effort to dislodge and destroy. And that if it, if we are to become the society that the vast majority of us claim that we want to be, if we are to be that society in which race plays no part in the life chances of our fellow citizens, then the task of demolishing, deconstructing the idea of race belongs to all of us. It is not the job of black people alone to con confront racism. This task of recognizing the structural nature of racism of examining how structures and cultures that we have built around us within organizations can incubate racial thinking or make racial inequalities less visible to us and lead to unequal outcomes. These conversations, uncomfortable though they are, challenging though they are, self-examining though they are, those challenges are the entry price of the society that three quarters of us say 
we want to live in. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much uh, for that. That was that was really powerful. Plenty there to digest. Just to kick things off, um, and David, you spoke about it as well as Naomi and Nicola, but how do we, when it's been a topic which is spoken about by millions of people around the world, how does this moment in time not become just a moment in time, Naomi? I think we have to take action. Um, we can't just sit back and... Uh, hear all this rhetoric going on and say, yes, I agree and do nothing. You know, each and every one of us have to take action within ourselves. We have to look deep inside ourselves. We have to look closer of how we actually interact and consume information. And we have to do something about that because the behavior cues that we give out to the younger generation, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, are going to be profound. They're looking at seeing what we're doing. And it's obvious that they are changing the, the narrative as they come into the workforce, but we are actually leading that in a way. So um, in order for us to actually move anything, each and every one of us must make that move, must actually change something. Otherwise the status quo will always stay the same. Brilliant. Um, Nicola, we spoke earlier about having those conversations, whether they've been in your workplace, your home or at school or whatever. And this question's just come in. It says, what is the best way to expand your horizons and learn and grow by asking questions without unintentionally making someone feel uncomfortable or put on the spot? You have to ask, maybe explain um, first that the question that you're asking might not be um, explained in the right way before you, so you don't offend anybody. Um, and then go ahead and ask the questions because it's, to, to understand and to learn, you have to, you have to ask questions. Absolutely. David, just to pick up on that, because you mentioned it, these uncomfortable conversations that we're just going to have to get comfortable with. But do you think part of the hesitation to people entering into any of these conversations is due to a slight cancel culture and someone just getting terminology wrong or for fear of maybe saying the wrong thing actually inhibits any sense of change because you'd rather have the conversation and it be slightly rough or raw around the edges than not having the conversation at all is that right David? I think it is right but I think these conversations are happening and I think one of the reasons that they're happening is because people are also reading and they're self-educating themselves now maybe I would say this because I write books but one of the most remarkable things about the past you know 18 months is the number of people who have uh, may, maybe perhaps motivated by the time that we had because of the pandemic and lockdown who have bought books on race and on black history and engage with those ideas in ways that they never have before. They've watched programs about these issues. So I think a lot of people are, um, are not relying just on conversations to, uh, to understand these issues. They're actually going out and they're reading and they're self-educating. There's been an incredible um, um, expedition of, um, of, of self-learning. I mean, the, last summer, um, Renny Adelodge's book, uh, and why I'm no, no longer talking to white people about race, that made her the first black British person ever to be number one, top of the Sunday Times bestseller list. Um, that wouldn't have happened without, without the Black Lives Matter moment, without the murder of George Floyd, without everything that flowed from it. So I think a lot of this is, is self-education, which is then, I think, making people bold enough to have those conversations. Absolutely. Um, Naomi, a question's coming for you. It says, if you hear someone being microaggressive, and I guess microaggressions can be displayed by voice or by action, how do you call them out on this? I think that one of the um, main thing is to not go in the, the attack. Um, when we say things with, um, uh, you know, with courtesy, and uh, we, we come in at, at it with a, with a, a calm um, um, disposition, we lower the defenses and we open the dialogue and keep it open. So that's number one. We have to actually go into it with a, a sense of, um, okay, let, let's tackle this in a calm um, way and not in a defensive way. Secondly, be very clear. Be very clear why it's a microaggression. I mean, you can say, you know, Hugo, what you just said right now, um, I find it very defensive. And I think lots of people would, but don't you think we would, we're trying to move through um, an environment where everyone can feel included? And of course, the person's going to say yes. Um, so when that happens, then you can actually start to have a, a consensual um, um, uh, conversation and dialogue about what these microaggressions 
um, um, mean and how they have a negative impact on other people. Because at the end of the day, sometimes people don't realize that they're issuing microaggressions. It's baked inside our language and our language is still very archaic for this time. You know, we're using old ways of saying things and trying to put it into a dialogue of a new way of thinking about race and culture. So we have to now be very cognizant about our language, our vernacular, the way we say things and how we say them in order to keep the, the, the um, dialogue open and to tackle microaggressions in, a, in an eloquent way. Lovely. Um, this next question is a great question because it is turning the dial and it starts by saying, what can I do to help? And in order to do this, we're talking about starting a conversation, but beyond that, I know this is a group wide movement, but is there anything I can do as an individual? I'll start with you, David. What we're seeing is, is people recognizing that, um, that this is a collective endeavor, that it is a group, group exercise, but it's also an individual exercise and a collective exercise. What I see is, 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 is people who are, it's, I don't think it's, it's always about calling out racism. I think it's, it's about um, asking, in a meeting, what are we doing about representation? It's about recognizing the ways in which race operates. Now, if, if, if you walk into a boardroom in a London company and everyone's white, it doesn't seem abnormal. If you walk down the streets of London and everyone's white, it would seem unusual. When you make that transition from the street and you go up the escalator, up the elevator, into the boardroom, and all of the non-white people have disappeared, that is abnormal, and yet we've normalized it. I work in television. The, the working population of London is about a third non-white. I've never been on a film set where a third of people are non-white in London. Yet all that would represent is normality. I think what people are, are, are doing you know, individually is recognizing the workings of race and then saying something about it, asking, raising their voice, putting their hand up, saying, what are we going to do about this? And this is something I see not just from people of color, I see it, you know, across the sectors I work in, um, from, from, from you know, lots of people, particularly people in leadership, things are changing. We have a long way to go and the failures of the recent past, the half-hearted initiatives and gestures, I mean, we've got even further and a mountain to climb, but I am seeing people being proactive about this. What are we doing on this project to address inequality? Brilliant. Naomi, Nicola, anything to add on that? I agree. I think that um, people are leaning into the conversation and, um, you know, I've been doing loads and loads and loads of training for leadership um, in terms of, you know, changing that lens of how we see each other and how we see ourselves within that lens. And, you know, when we talk about the Gen Z generation, which is the most diverse generation ever, and it's, it's more than likely that Gen Alpha, which is coming up after that, will be even more diverse. Um, their way of seeing the world is completely changing because they have their mobile phones and they see the world as a, a smaller unit than we, our generations of generations above did. So um, consciousness, cognizance, ideas, lenses are actually changing and we will hopefully start to see that reflecting in our leadership and board and C-suites um, in the next few years, hopefully, um, because you know, it is uncomfortable, but like, you know, David is saying, we have to lean into that discomfort in order to change things and feel comfortable again. And it, it's, it's happening. Brilliant. Um, Nicola, question for you. It starts with a statement. Nicola will be the first same sex couple on Strictly, yay, and congratulations. How has she been? And does she have any advice on dealing with coming out in the workplace or dealing with negative reaction to sharing your identity in the workplace? Well, Strictly was definitely a, a big, big step, for, big step forward. Um, I think it was something that was needed and it was way, way overdue. Um, so it was, it was great to be able to push the BBC into the 20th century with that. Um, as for coming out in the workplace, um, definitely only do it if it's safe to do. And there is potential that it possibly could affect um, how people see you but there's also um, an upside as well one that you can actually be yourself in the workplace and two you might also actually inspire other people to come out in the workplace and you might and, and a third one is that you might have more supporters on your side than you actually realize 
Yeah, thank you so much for that. Question from, from black burnout to black joy, this year has been hard for minorities in the workplace. How can we uplift support and center joy and fulfillment for BAME employees in the workplace? Naomi. First of all, I'd like to say, let's try and get rid of um, BAME um, because it, again, it just puts people in a big category. You know, there's so many different types of multi um, ethnicities within that BAME, which I think we again, we should start changing our language and be a little bit more specific one. Um, I also for, you know, black colleagues, I think it's taking your own agency of um, who you, who you, what you want to re represent, who are you? Um, how do you actually, what is your lens? Because actually at the end of the day, it's not just white folks that have to change their lens about how they see us, it's how we see ourselves as well and how we see the outer world. And so we all have to do the work. We all have to, because growing up in the UK, you know, like I said, the cognitive programming is everywhere. We are, we have, you know, been um, infused with it. Um, as young as four and five, we see behavior cues of it. So we all have to do the work and we all have to be a lot more cognizant of how we react to things and how we change the way we, we move within the workplace and, um, and how we would like to kind of like be part of that, that, that conversation um, of inclusiveness and belonging um, and, you know, make it happen. So, you know, for, for not just black folks, for, for everyone, I think that it's, it's, um, it's a collective and we have to shift our lens to see ourselves as a collective rather than individual ethnicities or, or um, uh, uh, individual you know, categories of diversity going into the dialogue. We all have to see ourselves as one. And that's a different shift in um, the paradigm of self. It's a different shift to seeing how, who you are and what you represent. I've heard people in the office uh, comment on diversity inclusion initiatives, disadvantaging white people. What can we do to change this attitude and response, David? I mean, this is where we get into issues about equity and versus, versus equality. We, we've normalized situations and cultures that advantage people based on class, based on gender, and based on race in ways that we don't notice. So when somebody has got the right accent, when they're male and white and they fit in and their careers are gilded, we almost don't notice that because it's been so normalized. And when we try to put um, um, structures in place to, uh, to acknowledge disadvantage, then suddenly it's controversial. Take university admissions. At the moment, there's a big move within university admissions to recognize that a, a girl who gets three A's from an Asian family growing up in a two bedroom flat in Grenfell Tower has done something different to a boy who went to Eton and gets the same grade and to recognizing the other elements that have got her, because they're not equal, she has done more. Now, recognizing that is fundamental to understanding their relative achievements and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're in a battle for places that are limited. Now, that suddenly becomes, it becomes controversial, recognizing that private schools that 7% of the population go to, hothouse people and get through exams. We're so familiar with it that we, we, don't, we don't really notice that that's another form of inequity. So it's only when forms of uh, reshaping society that we're unfamiliar with or suggested that suddenly that they become apparent to us. So some of it is about recognizing that there's, there's, there are all sorts of ways in which people are gaming the system. There are all sorts of ways in which groups are advantaged over another. And that to have a society where we actually have the changes, the levels of equality we want, is going to create some engineering. And that's the difference between equity and equality. It's going to take some changes. Brilliant. Um, another question for everyone on the panel. Um, it says, you're also successful. How do you stay motivated? I'll start with you, Nicola. For me, it's creating new goals for myself. I'm always thinking of the next thing that I want to do. I'm always, I'm always out comp um, completing the next mission. Um, I think that's what gives me my drive for success. Just always thinking of new ways, new things that I can accomplish um, all the time. Naomi? I agree totally with Nicola. It's about that vision of self, of doing new things. You, you know, it's human nature not to, um, well, for some people, not to want to, to actually get more and more and more and more. 
And for me, it's, um, you know, when I complete a task or a goal, I want the next thing. And I think bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, so I am extremely excited about what's going to be happening for me in the next uh, 10 years. Um, because my, my vision has, you know, I'm not settling for anything uh, for the level that I had just completed. I want to always kind of like see something that I can make an impact um, in this world and within my family and my, my peer group. So yes, thinking differently and bigger each time. David? I mean, I'm, I, I'm someone who believes that our society is misshapen by um, what psychologists call self-attribution fallacy. Um, I'm lucky. I went to school with people in a in a very poor comprehensive school in the northeast of England who were just as bright and capable as me, um, and they didn't have the familial support. They didn't have a mother like my mother, um, and they weren't able to to advance in life. Um, I find strength in recognizing that I've been fortunate. I have some abilities, but so do other people who have no 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 chance. And I'm motivated by the in, the unfairness and the inequality of that. I share so much of what you've just said just then. Um, since retiring from my sport, I used to play rugby. Um, my commitment, my passion, my drive, more so than ever in the last 18 months, has actually been um, an act of service. Um, I feel as if I'm big enough, ugly enough and strong enough to be able to get to where I've got to. And there's still so much that I want to do. But actually, it's about creating um, a far better community environment and a sense of equity right across this country for everyone else. And I think once you can put yourself into or export your feelings and your passion into wanting more for everyone else is actually so, so rewarding. I think it's really nourishing, um, not just thinking about yourself and thinking about how you can help everyone else. So actually the act of service is something which I, which I do take very seriously. Um, and I think it's really important. David, now the question, um, do you have any book recommendations? I know you've already mentioned one, but any others you could quickly share? I'd read a Carla's book, uh, Natives, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a brilliant book. And I'd read Peter Fryer's book, Staying Power, the first long encyclopedic history of the black presence in Britain. One thing businesses can do right now to improve diversity at work, Naomi. Get more diverse leadership on board um, and make it inclusive and really work on that inclusion piece so that uh, we can move to a place where people can feel that they belong. Um, question came in, within our business, we've launched a program that allows colleagues to ask questions privately with the answer provided back to those with lived experience and then shared back across the company. I think that's so important. I've tried to set something up similarly at BT Sports. Um, having a conversation might be quite difficult and not everyone wants to be able to share their lived experiences especially if it's uncomfortable. But if you can create someone which is private, which is confidential um, and taken away from that shop front, then I think that allows people to engage more, especially if you're trying to um, deal with this. My well, many thanks to Naomi, to Nicola, to David. Thank you so much for taking that time. Thank you to everyone that joined us online here today. Hopefully you found some tips there. Of course, is the conversation that isn't just limited to this one hour that we've had here, please do keep the conversation going within your workplace. If you would like any more information on the speakers this afternoon, then please contact one of the Speakers Corners team. Thank you so much for listening. Take care, look after yourself.